Good morning. First, I'd like to uh, bring you greetings from the Church of the Redeemer, United Church of Christ in New Haven, where I serve as the associate pastor. Um, one of the blessings of, of my call at the Church of the Redeemer is this wonderful covenant I have with that church that allows me to teach and preach about this subject that is so dear to my heart two Sundays a month at other UCC churches in Connecticut and sometimes beyond. And so I thank you for inviting me to be in your pulpit this morning and to bring you this message. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the Old Testament scripture reading we heard this morning from the prophet Micah, I think provides a wonderful entrance into my topic of mass incarceration. It's almost as if Micah were here today, surveying the landscape of our land as he makes his proclamations. You see, Micah was a prophet who was preaching in the southern kingdom of Judah near the end of the 8th century BCE. He was a prophet who understood his task to be a teacher of truth, to expose injustice and inequality, to offer a word of hope and salvation, to make known a vision of a new and transformed way of life for his community and for his world. I think he offers us that same vision today. This passage that we will explore this morning begins appropriately, I think, in a courtroom. But this is no ordinary courtroom. No, this is a court where God is serving as a prosecutor in the great outdoors, bringing charges against a people who have allowed injustice to become rampant in the land. This is a court where God is serving also as the judge and the jury, God calls upon his people, upon you and me, to rise up and plead our case before the mountains. And God instructs the mountains, the very foundations of the earth, to listen, for God has a bone to pick with us mortals. In this courtroom scene, we even find God as the plaintiff, saying, O my people, what have I done to you? In what way have I wearied you? Then God reminds us of all that we owe to God, and it's a lot. It's our very lives. As Micah allows the scene to unfold, we are reminded of the ways that we try to please God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Will God find me worthy if I show up at church every Sunday? Can I buy my way into God's good graces with extravagant gifts? No, says Micah. Micah says that what the Lord requires is pretty simple. He says that we must do justice. He says that we must love kindness. He says that we must walk humbly with God. So what does that mean for us today? In what way can we take these words of Micah and apply them to the justice or lack thereof happening in our land today? Well, I believe that if we apply these words to our nation's system of mass incarceration, we would find ourselves indicted by Micah's words. So let's take a look at Micah's list of requirements one by one to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. First, do justice. Our criminal justice system, as it stands today, offers precious little justice for many Americans. And that Lack of justice has resulted in a system of mass incarceration the like of which has never been seen before in our world. 
The fact is the United States holds in its prisons, federal and state, a combined total of 2.3 million people. That's one in every 99 adults behind bars. And if we count the numbers of people who are on probation or parole, those still under some kind of correctional control, still unable due to a criminal record to re-enter law-abiding society, that number climbs to a staggering 65 million people. Mass incarceration. And many of the people who find themselves languishing in our prisons are young black men, many of whom have been convicted of a nonviolent drug offense. I told you that the rate of incarceration for all adults is one in 99. Well, the rate of young black men between the ages of 20 and 34 is an unbelievable one in nine. America today holds more of her black citizens in prison than did South Africa during the height of the apartheid. We have more black people in prison today than were enslaved in 1850, a full decade before the Civil War. As you hear these numbers, as I heard these numbers for the very first time, I was moved to ask, well, aren't these people just more criminal than everybody else in America? It's a fair question. But the answer is no. Many of them are not. What many are is subject to the targeted enforcement of our nation's purportedly race-blind policy called the War on Drugs. Enforcement targeted primarily at poor communities, most often poor communities of color. The fact is that our nation's prisons are mostly packed with our nation's poor people. Two-thirds of those in prison lived below the poverty line prior to their imprisonment. And upwards of 90% of all those incarcerated in our nation's prisons suffer from some sort of addictive disorder, some sort of behavioral disorder, and or mental illness, many of them needing treatment rather than imprisonment. And while many of those in prison are young men of color, the largest increase in the rates of incarceration over the last few years have been poor white men and increasingly women who overwhelmingly get caught up in criminal activity as a result of being victims themselves. We live in a nation that imprisons its poorest, darkest citizens at an alarming rate. We live in a nation that imprisons its mentally ill citizens at an alarming rate. We, as a society, have let this happen, even though most of us, without knowing what the actual numbers are, would answer Micah's indictment by saying, well, of course I do justice. We do justice as a nation. But it isn't so. It isn't so because we've taken what is essentially a public health issue, drug addiction, and criminalized it. Unlike our response to alcohol abuse, which we usually respond to with treatment, we have made the abuse of drugs a criminal offense. Strike one on Micah's list of requirements from our Lord to do justice. We do not do justice in America. So how about requirement number two, loving kindness? How are we doing there? Well, I would submit that we're not doing too hot there either. One certainly can't find any kindness in the way our society deals with those coming out of prison, allegedly having paid their debt to society. You see, our criminal justice system has penalties and prohibitions that go well beyond the actual period of incarceration. No, when folks from poor communities are released after having served their time, they can't go home and live in public housing, even if that's where they're from, even if that's where their wives and children, mothers and fathers are. It's not allowed by law, so they're homeless. 
They can't get on any kind of public assistance, not even food stamps. It's not allowed by law. So they're hungry. Employment discrimination is legal. And most, if not all, employers <laughs> will not hire them. So they have no prospects. The system is structured such that the most rational thing for them to do is reoffend and go back to prison. And then we are dismayed at the high rate of recidivism, even though the system as it stands offers them little other choice. I submit that what is missing is love, loving kindness for these people in our society whose lives we think are so very different from our own. But are they truly? And that question takes me back to Micah's requirements. The last one, to walk humbly with God. How humble are we when we look at folks who are addicted to illegal drugs and we cannot find, who cannot find any treatment programs, even though they try, because we, as voters, won't vote to fund those kinds of expenditures. Even though, as taxpayers here in Connecticut, we do spend $1 billion a year to keep the prisons open and operating. How humble are we when we look at those folks and think, I'm so much better than they are. I would never take illegal drugs. I think it's instructive to stop for a moment and think about why people take drugs at all. I think we can all agree it's because they are in pain, physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, spiritual pain, and they take drugs to try to deaden that pain. So when someone who lives in Essex or Westport or Granby or the East Rock neighborhood of New Haven where my church is, when they feel that kind of pain, they go to their primary care physician who writes them a prescription and sends them off to the drugstore to buy some perfectly legal drug like Valium or Zoloft or Percocet. But another person, a poor person living in the inner city with few prospects and less opportunities, worried about where he or she will get the next meal to put on the table for the kids, when that person wants to deaden the pain, the choice they have is different. They probably don't have a primary care physician. They certainly don't have any way to get to one because we also don't adequately fund public transportation. And if they did find their way to a private doctor and did get a prescription, they would need to weather, worry about whether they had the money to pay for it, even the copay. Instead, they go down to the corner where some petty dealer is selling a similar substance in a really small amount for a very little bit of money, at least initially, and it's all very illegal because we've made it so very illegal. And we look at that poor mother trying to get through another day. We look at her with scorn. I know we don't have much humility going on when we tisk tisk about her behavior. And that's just comparing the use of legal drugs to illegal drugs. I might even suggest that folks who live in areas where there is no targeted enforcement of the war on drugs just might be abusing illegal drugs as well. I won't ask folks here to raise their hands if they've ever taken an illegal drug and not suffered any legal consequence as a result. I'll just point out that thinking of ourselves as so much better than those people whose lives have been devastated by our society's rush to incarcerate is surely not a sign of our walking humbly with God. If, like me, you're surprised about the cause of our nation's system of mass incarceration and want to learn more about it, I invite you to stay after for a second hour where I will go into this in much more detail and unlike a sermon where you have to sit there and listen to me, at the adult forum you can actually ask me questions. I invite challenging questions. I believe that imprisoning our poorest 
Americans. I believe that imprisoning our darkest Americans in massive numbers and then setting up a system that locks them in a kind of poverty from which there is little or no escape and then blaming them for their misfortune is not what the prophet Micah tells us the Lord requires. Imprisoning our poorest Americans and then creating a system where their punishment never ends does not square in any way with doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with God. So what is it that we can do? How can we fix this? Well, we can advocate for an end to policies that create and support mass incarceration. Policies like stop and frisk. Policies like zero tolerance in schools, which has done more to fill the pre-K to prison pipeline than anything else. Our juvenile justice system here in Connecticut is filled with over 75% young people of color, most of them black boys, while black people only make up 9% of Connecticut's population. And these numbers are not unique to Connecticut. They represent a nationwide reality. What is it that we can do? We can advocate for early childhood education, universal, free, since over 70% of all offenders or ex-offenders are high school dropouts. We can think about hiring ex-offenders, offering them a chance to start over with a clean slate. These people, for the most part, want to work. They want to feel the pride that you and I take for granted, the pride that comes from doing a job and doing it well and being able to successfully support themselves and their families. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, told us how to fulfill the law, the law of Moses and the law of God. He said, owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves has already fulfilled the law. Fulfilling the law, says Paul, is about loving God's people. All God's people, those sitting in the pews next to us and those sitting somewhere in a prison cell. In the fourth chapter of Luke, we are told that Jesus went into his hometown of Galilee and announced in the synagogue, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Can we do any less? I believe what Micah says about what the Lord requires. I believe we need to take Jesus' words to heart, and work as partners with God to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor when the captives would go free. I believe that Micah is calling us in our time to begin to dismantle our broken system, the broken system that our criminal justice system has become. And I believe that in so doing, we will begin in a new way to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Amen.